A very good evening aspirants. Now before getting into the news article discussion, I have an important announcement for you to know. Tamil Nadu government has made an announcement in the 2023-24 to budget to aid civil service aspirants. To help aspirants access better coaching facilities and materials, Tamil Nadu government is planning to provide cash incentives. As part of this incentive, 1000 civil service aspirants will be selected every year through a screening test and the selected candidate will be provided rupees 7500 per month for 10 months to prepare for the preliminary examination those students who clear the preliminary examination will be provided a lump sum amount of 25000 rupees the tamil nadu government has allotted 10 crore for this initiative tamil nadu skill development corporation tnsdc will implement a scheme in coordination with anna staff administrative college it is a good opportunity for aspirants. We'll update about the screening test when further information about the scheme is made available to the public. So with this good news, we'll enter into our news article discussion. Today's date is 22nd of March 2023. Displayed here are the list of news articles that we are going to discuss today. For a change, today let's start with the quiz question provided in the newspaper. Now look at the quiz questions. Today, the 22nd of March is observed as World Water Day by the United Nations. So a quiz about freshwater resources is given here. Now in this discussion, let us try to find the answers for these quiz questions. Okay, let's start with the first question. The question says, this is the largest freshwater lake in the world by volume. It is also known for two more parameters. Identify the lake and what are the parameters? See the answer for this question is Lake Baikal. Lake Baikal is located in Russian Siberia. This lake is the world's largest freshwater lake by volume. It is around 22,995 cubic kilometer. This single lake alone contains around 20% of the world's fresh surface water. Additionally, Lake Baikal is also the deepest and the oldest lake in the world. Now moving on to the second question. Ular Lake is one of the largest freshwater lake in South Asia. A navigation project at the mouth of Ular Lake has been in talks for decades. In which country is the lake situated? What is the name of the project? Now to answer this question, look at this map showing the location of Ular Lake. Ular Lake is a freshwater lake located in the Bandipora district of Jammu and Kashmir. This lake is mainly fed by the Jhelum River. The navigation project that is mentioned in the question is the Tulbul project. Tulbul project is a navigation lock cum control structure at the mouth of Ular Lake. The project was proposed to increase the depth of the lake and make it more navigable. Remember, Ular Lake is the largest natural lake in India. Okay? Now moving on to the next question, Kajera, near Borongo, Mavogo and Rukarara are the headwaters of this lake. The source of one of the two main tributaries of the river is Lake Tana and the other has been in dispute. Identify the river. Now look at this map showing the location of Lake Tana. Lake Tana is a freshwater lake located in Ethiopia. This lake is the source of the river Blue Nile. It is one of the main tributaries of the river Nile. Blue Nile joins the river White Nile at Kartao, Sudan. So the answer for this question is Nile. Now moving on to the next question, which is the world's largest freshwater lake? This lake is shared by four countries, which are they? To answer this question, look at this map. The longest freshwater lake in the world is Lake Tanganyika. It is located in the Great African Rift Valley. The four countries bordering the lake are Zambia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi and Tanzania. Also note here that while Lake Tanganyika is the longest freshwater lake in the world, the longest lake in the world is the Caspian Sea. Okay, don't confuse between the both. Now moving on to the last question. 
This river is 61 meter long at its longest constant point and has been named the world's shortest river by the Guinness Book of World Records before Guinness eliminated the category. Name the river. In which country does it flow? See, the answer for this question is Roe River, which is located in Montana, USA. It is the shortest river in the world. This river runs from Gaint Spring to the Missouri River. So that's all regarding this discussion. You can check whether the answers for the question is right or wrong in tomorrow's newspaper. Okay. I hope this discussion helped you to revise a little bit of world map. So these learn the points and let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this editorial article. It is about the keynote speech at the Lanting Forum in Beijing. In this forum, Chinese Minister of Foreign Affairs highlighted the recently unveiled Global Security Initiative, that is GSI concept paper. Now, this GSI is presented as a China-led framework to restore stability and security. As per the Chinese Minister, five major pillars for the effective implementation of GSI include mutual respect, openness and inclusion, multilateralism, mutual benefit and a holistic approach. These five principles are projected as China-led framework. But the author is saying that China is acting the exact opposite way of these principles. So in this discussion, we will see how China is acting in the opposite way and why China is propagating these principles all of a sudden. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference. You can pause the video and just go through it. First of all, why China is promoting these principles all of a sudden? See, as per the author, China's promotion of such principles is timely and critical. If you see the global scenario now, there are shifts happening in the international geopolitical landscape. So, according to the author, China has two reasons for the promotion of such principles. Firstly, as per author, China wants to compete with United States leadership and dominate US-led concepts. And that is why China is promoting GSI now. Secondly, if you see in the context of war, there are many perceptions among developing countries about the West and the war. So by promoting such principles, China wants itself to place in the global arena as an alternative leader. We all know that West and its allies on one side and Russia on the other side were seen as a global power in the past by the developing countries. But now that perception is changing because of the war. So here China wants to present itself as an alternative leader for the developing countries. Now in my opinion, the China plus one strategy might also be a reason for this propaganda. So what is this China plus one strategy? It is a strategy in which businesses avoid investing solely in China and diversify their businesses into other countries. Now this is done to mitigate the economic and geopolitical risk associated with the forum. Okay. Now the West is promoting this China plus one strategy to counter its dominance. So because of that also China might have promoted this propaganda. So now coming back even though these might be the reasons according to the author China is just promoting these principles and in reality they are not following it. Now let us see why the author is saying like this. See as per the author China's recent track record of external engagement is the exact opposite of GSI principle. What is the first principle of GSI? It is mutual respect, right? This principle centers on the need for countries to follow United Nations Charter and international law. Following international laws will facilitate relations based on mutual trust and respect for each other's sensitivities. Now the question is, is China following this principle? No. I will tell you why. Firstly, China has disregarded the confidence building measures and bilateral agreements with India regarding the border dispute. And by doing this, China has undermined India's territorial integrity and sovereignty. Secondly, in the recent years, China has increased its assertive maneuver in the South China Sea. This was done by militarizing the disputed maritime territory at the expense of the sovereignty and sovereign rights of China's Southeast Asian neighbors. Here, sovereign rights means exclusive economic zone rights. So here also China has disregarded the UN clause, that is United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. 
This is because China's assertive military intrusion will block the access to exclusive economic zone for the neighboring countries. So these are the reasons why author is saying that China is not following the principle of mutual respect. Now let us see the second principle which is openness and inclusion. See China violates this principle by engaging in exclusionary policies in the East and South China seas. The principle is talking about inclusion. But the actions of China in Taiwan and South China seas indicates China's narrowly defined interest to consolidate its sphere of influence in the region. Okay? Now the third principle is multilateralism, right? It focuses on bilateral and multilateral security cooperation and consultation to address issues of concern. Here we can say that China plays a prominent role in various multilateral institutions like SEO, BRICS, UNSC, etc. But on the other side, it is constraining members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nation, that is Asia, from perceiving collective action against Beijing's wish. China is also delaying the establishment of code of conduct for the South China Sea. This is because China has claims in the South China Sea. So it is stopping other countries from pursuing their rights. So here the author's question is how China is promoting the principle of multilateral cooperation when it is not ready to acknowledge the claims of neighboring countries. Here only China knows the answer for this. Now the fourth principle is mutual benefit. It involves positive cooperation where the parties involved will equally benefit. Here author is quoting the example of China's Belt and Road Initiative. According to the author, it is a much needed cooperative framework. This is because there is significant infrastructure deficit in the developing countries. But here China violates the principle of mutual benefit by funding unsustainable projects for countries with low or non-existing credit ratings. So the result is debt burdens of these countries. Moreover, China insisted on receiving a large share in its bid for a joint exploration of resources with Manila in Philippine waters. This is not mutual benefit, right? This is self-benefit. Now, the last principle is holistic approach. What is the meaning of holistic? Whole, right? So, in the global order, holistic approach means involving all countries to eliminate the traditional and non-traditional security threats. But here also the record is against China. According to the author, China's rise in the transitional multipolar international system has resulted in power competitions with established great powers, that is US, and rising great powers, which is India. So the author's concern is, rather than being holistic, China's engagements with these powers indicate a more narrowly defined goal for its power interest. According to this, China itself is the reason for insecurity in the recent years. China's lack of accountability ranges from COVID-19 pandemic to arming terror groups like in Myanmar. Therefore, the author is saying that China's GSI is far from being a sustainable, equitable and transparent solution to the growing insecurity that the world is facing now. Rather, the GSI indicates China's attempt to counter U.S. leadership through narratives. Okay, these are all some of the takeaway points from this news article discussion. Make note of all the points. I see this editorial as a comprehension of all the points that can support your argument in the main answer. Again, these are personal views of the author, so use it wise. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now, take a look at this news article displayed here. It talks about the steps taken by three states to stop illegal sand mining taking place in National Chambal Sanctuary, which is located in the tri-junction of Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan and Uttar Pradesh. The said sanctuary is home to the critically endangered species called gharials. The habitat of gharial is threatened by the illegal sand mining taking place along the National Chambal Sanctuary. This is why a high-level meeting was conducted in Jaipur regarding the issue of illegal mining. As a result of this meeting only, three states have commenced joint action to stop the illegal sand mining taking place in the National Chambal Sanctuary. So this is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about National Chambal Sanctuary in the prelims perspective. 
Firstly, as I already said, National Chambal Sanctuary is located in the northern border of Madhya Pradesh with some parts of the sanctuary extending in Rajasthan and Uttar Pradesh. The National Chambal Sanctuary is located right on the Chambal River which is a right bank tributary of the Emuna River. Now let us see a few points regarding the Chambal River. See the Chambal River originates in the Vindhyan ranges of Madhya Pradesh. It then flows northwards into Rajasthan before forming the boundary between Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan. The tributaries of Chambal River includes Shipra, Kali Sindh, Banas, Parbati, Gamir and etc. The Chambal River Basin is famous for its bad land topography. The topography here is characterized by undulating flat plain, huge gullies and ravines. So this is about the Chambal River. Now coming back to National Chambal Sanctuary, the three important endangered species living in the National Chambal Sanctuary are Garial, Red Crowned Roof Turtle and the Gangetic Dolphins. Other large threatened inhabitants of the sanctuary include Mugger Crocodile, Smooth Coated Otter, Striped Hyena and Indian Wolf. Also know that National Chambal Sanctuary is listed as an important bird area. So this is all about the National Chambal Sanctuary and about the river Chambal. Make note of all the points and revise it once before the preliminary examination. So these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now look at this text and context article. Recently the Kerala government announced that the state's first waste to energy project would be set up in Kolikot. The government plans to set up the waste to energy plant in two years and it is expected to have a power generation capacity of 6 megawatts. So this is what the article is talking about. The article covers the basics about waste to energy plant, how it functions, its advantages, the challenges in running a waste to energy plant and the steps that can be taken to address the challenges. So as part of the discussion, we will see all of these points in detail. Before that, the syllabus relevant to this news article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. Firstly, what is a waste to energy plant? The name itself is actually self-explanatory. It converts waste to useful energy. To be little elaborate, waste to energy plant or facilities that convert various types of waste like municipal solid waste, biomass and industrial waste into usable forms of energy. Now look at this picture. This is your typical waste to energy plant. Here the waste is burnt to produce heat. This heat energy is used to generate steam. The steam is used to turn a turbine which in turn produces electricity. Now let us see the step by step process that is involved in the working of waste to energy plants. First step involves the collection and transportation of waste material to the plant. See these plants use waste as a source of energy. So the collection and transportation of waste materials to the plant is the first step involved in the process. The second step is sorting and pre-processing of the waste. The municipal waste that is used in these plants are not homogeneous. It has different types of waste in it. For example, municipal solid waste in India is 55 to 60 percentage biodegradable organic waste, 25 to 30 percentage non-biodegradable dry waste and around 15 percentage slit stones and drain waste. Here the slit stones and drain waste cannot be burnt and hence cannot be used in the waste to energy plant. The biodegradable organic waste and the non-biodegradable dry waste can be burnt. In this biodegradable organic waste has very low calorific value so it is not economical to use it to run the plant. So these biodegradable organic waste are converted into biomass and organic composite in a biogas plant. Now coming to the non-biodegradable dry waste. The non-biodegradable dry waste contains stuffs like hard plastic, metals, e-waste, low-grade plastic, rugs and cloth. In this the hard plastic, metal and e-waste can be recycled and it makes less economic sense to burn them in a waste to energy plant. So the items like hard plastic, metals and e-waste which constitute around 10 to 15 percentage of non-biodegradable dry waste are recycled. The remaining 85 percentage of non-biodegradable dry waste that include low-grade plastic, rugs, cloth and other stuffs that cannot be recycled or used as raw materials in these plants. 
the sorting and pre-processing of the waste is the most important step involved in the process. This is because sorting helps in increasing the calorific value. For example, if we burn 1 kilogram of mixed or pre-sorted Indian waste, it produces 1500 kilocalories of energy. But after sorting the non-biodegradable dry waste and if we burn 1 kilogram of it, it produces 2800 to 3000 kilocalories of energy. This high calorific value of non-recyclable dry waste helps in the efficient functioning of the waste to energy plants. Okay. Now moving on, the third step involved is the combustion of the waste in a furnace. The combustion process generates heat and steam. Then in the fourth step, the steam generated in the third step is used to power a turbine or generator. This process produces electricity. Lastly, the ash and residue generated in this combustion process is properly processed. This processed waste is used to fill old landfills. So these are some of the major processes involved in waste to energy power generation plants. Now we will see the advantages associated with running a waste to energy plant. See the first advantage is reduction of landfill space. Waste to energy plants help reduce the amount of waste that end up in landfills. This results in reduction in the need for landfill space particularly near big cities. Okay. The second advantage is energy production. On one hand, these plants reduce the amount of waste that ends up in the landfill and on the other hand, they generate electric power. This is a win-win situation, right? The electricity generated by these plants can be used to power homes and businesses. This also reduces our country's dependence on electricity generation by fossil fuels. Now lastly, we have the economic benefits. Waste to energy plants can create jobs and provide a source of revenue for the community. When the plants function efficiently, they can also apply for carbon credits. So these are all some of the benefits associated with waste to energy plants. Due to benefits associated with these plants, in India around 100 plants are already constructed. But the thing is that only a few of these plants are actually functioning right now. This is because these waste to energy plants face a number of challenges. Now let us see these challenges associated with waste to energy power generation. First issue is improper segregation at source. As we already saw, only after sorting, the calorific value of the waste increases. But in India, we rarely segregate the waste at source. This makes the sorting process at the power plant very difficult. The second issue is higher power production cost. See the cost of power produced from these plants is already high. In addition to this, due to improper segregation at source, the sorting process that is done in the power plant makes the process even more costlier. Due to this, the cost of power produced from these plants comes around 7 to 8 rupees per unit. But the cost of power produced from coal, hydro and solar energy comes at around 3 to 4 rupees per unit. Due to this, the state discounts are not purchasing the costly power that is produced by the waste to energy power plants. The third issue is the availability of raw materials. Here, let us see the case of proposed plant in Kolikod. The plant is expected to have a power production capacity of 6 MW. Typically, to produce 1 MW of power, the waste of energy plant required 50 tons per day of raw material. So, to operate the plant in Kolikod at full capacity, it would require around 300 tons per day of material. But study shows that Kolikod plant could source only 150 tons per day of material even when strict segregation practices are followed. So even in the best case scenario, the plant will only run at half capacity. From this, we can conclude that making sure enough good quality raw material is available for the waste to energy plant is a big issue. Then there is the issue of environmental concerns. The combustion of waste materials can release pollutants into the air and water. This can have negative impacts on human health and the environment. Lastly, public perception on these plants is very poor. This is because the plant have huge pollution potential and impacts the health of people near the plant. 
So these are some of the challenges associated with the waste to energy plants. Now what are the steps that can be taken to address these challenges? Firstly, proper segregation of waste at the source will help the plant in a long way. To ensure proper segregation of waste at the source, door-to-door -door collection of municipal waste can be strictly implemented. Secondly, there is no denying that the power produced by these plants are costly. But these plants help in the disposal of municipal solid waste. So the government can provide some kind of incentives to the discoms to purchase power from these plants. Then a proper supply chain must be established to ensure that the plant receives sufficient quality raw materials at all times. Lastly, technology like carbon capture can be incorporated into these plants to reduce the pollution potential of the plant. This will also improve the public perception about the plant. Okay, so these are all some of the takeaway points that you have to note from this news article discussion. Actually, ways to energy power generation plants have a lot of potential. If we could address the challenges in the right way, we can reap the benefits of these plants. Okay. So with these learned points, now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now have a look at this front page article. It reports about the grant of an IMF bailout package to the country of Sri Lanka. As many of you already know, Sri Lanka is suffering from a severe economic meltdown. It is in this context only Sri Lanka has previously approached the IMF with a proposal to get a bailout package. After prolonged negotiations and some policy changes by Sri Lankan government, IMF has now granted a loan of $3 billion to the Sri Lankan government under the extended fund facility. So this is what is given in the news article. In this context, let us learn about what is this extended fund facility of IMF. Now before seeing about the extended fund facility, let us briefly see about the objectives of IMF. See the IMF or International Monetary Fund works to achieve sustainable growth and prosperity for all of its 190 member countries. It does so by supporting economic policies that promote financial stability and monetary cooperation. Know that IMF plays a proactive role in helping the countries which are facing balance of payment crisis. Balance of payment crisis occurs when a nation is unable to pay for its essential imports or service its external debt payments. So this is the objective of IMF. Now coming to the extended fund facility EFF of IMF. See the extended fund facility provides financial assistance to member countries of IMF which are facing serious medium term balance of payments problems because of structural weaknesses that require a considerable time to address. The main point to note here is that the credit under EFF is given to countries facing medium term BOP problems not short term. Okay, They may confuse you in the prelims using this statement. Now remember yet another medium term credit mechanism called the extended credit facility is also granted. This ECF is granted only to those countries which are in the category of low income states. It is one of the facilities of IMF under the Poverty Reduction and Growth Trust. Okay. Now coming back to EFF, say the countries which are receiving credit from IMF under the EFF route should focus on structural reforms to address institutional or economic weaknesses. So what about the loan duration? Typically EFF credits are approved for a period of 3 years. But in some cases it may be approved for period as long as 4 years to implement deep and sustained structural reforms. So what about the repayment time? The loan given under EFF can be repaid over 4.5 to 10 years in 12 equal semi-annual installments. Okay? Even India have borrowed using extended fund facility from IMF in the financial year 1981-82. to 82. But since 1993, India has not taken any financial assistance from IMF. Okay? So these learned points. Now let us move on to the next news article discussion. Now take a look at this news in numbers article in text and context page. It says that 1.48 lakh crore rupees was passed irrespective of Adani issue. Also the Minister of State for Finance had tabled the second batch of supplementary demands for grants in parliament. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context let us understand about supplementary grants and also different types of other grants. First of all why other grants are given? 
Now that budget contains the ordinary estimate of income and expenditure for one financial year. We also make budget estimates for our households. Is it always enough? No, right. Some unforeseen situations and circumstances arises at times. For this only, we have savings and other emergency funds. Likewise, government also have various other grants for extraordinary or special circumstances. The first such arrangement is supplementary grant. Let us say that government has allotted an expenditure of 20,000 crore rupees for some new scheme. We all know that in the budget 2023 to 24 also our finance minister has introduced many schemes and she also said the allotted fund for that scheme, right? But after proceeding into the year, government found that the allotted money was not enough. So now the government can ask the parliament for extra money. This extra money for the scheme is only called supplementary grant. So when the amount authorized by the parliament through the appropriation act is found to be insufficient for a particular scheme, then some amount is given as supplementary grant. Here you should know the difference between supplementary grant, additional grant and excess grant. See, additional grant is given when the money is needed for some new service which is not contemplated in the budget for that year. And the excess grant is given when money has been spent on any service during a financial year in excess of the amount granted for that service. So here, the government will spend the money first and then get it from the parliament. It is voted by the Lok Sabha after the financial year. You have to know one crucial point here. Before the demands for excess grants are submitted to the Lok Sabha for voting, they must be approved by the Public Accounts Committee of Parliament. Okay? Now make note of all these differences very sharply. Other grants include vote of credit, token grant, exceptional grant and etc. We'll see about them in some other discussion. So in this news article discussion, we saw about supplementary grants and we saw the difference between supplementary grant additional grant and excess grant so with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion now take a look at this news article it reports about the 148th foundation day celebrations of RA Samaj which took place at Delhi in the meeting our union home minister mentioned that Dayananda Saraswati's life is an inspiration for the Modi government he also said that the Prime Minister is working for national awakening, a concept which was originally based on the philosophy and teachings of Maharishi Dayananda Saraswati. So using this opportunity, let us learn about Dayananda Saraswati in prelims perspective. As you all know, Dayananda Saraswati is an Indian social reformer from the state of Gujarat who founded the Arya Samaj. His teachings and philosophy were based primarily on the Vedas. He was the author of numerous books. One of his famous book was the Satyat Prakash, which has remained a highly influential text on the philosophy of the Vedas. The book also deals with the various duties which need to be carried out by a human being. He was the first individual in India to ask for Swaraj from the foreign rule. He was against the practice of idolatry and believes in the infallibility of the Vedas. He promoted equal rights for women like a right to education and reading of Indian scriptures. The other important feature of Dayananda's teachings were that he was against the caste system and advocated the abolition of untouchability. After his death in the year 1883, Dayanand Anglo-Vedic schools were established all around India by his followers. Some of his notable followers are Lala Lajpat Roy and Swami Sradhanand. Dayanand Saraswati was of the view that confusions regarding the Vedas arose due to the misinterpretations of the Vedas. That is why Swami Dayanand indulged in writing rightful commentaries on the Vedas. He said that Veda were the guide to find the ultimate truth which he has emphasized throughout his commentary on the Vedas. These are all some of the important points that you have to remember about Swami Dayananda Saraswati. So with this we came to the end of this news article discussion. In this news article discussion we saw in briefly about Dayanand Saraswati who is an Indian social reformer from the state of Gujarat and the founder of Arya Samaj. So with these learned points now let us move on to the next news article discussion. 
Now take a look at this editorial article. Recently, the Punjab government has launched a major operation to arrest a separatist leader, Amrit Pal Singh. This is because Amrit Pal Singh openly talked about the creation of Khalistan. That is, he tried to revive the Khalistan movement in Punjab. The Khalistan movement is a Sikh separatist movement. This movement seeks to establish a sovereign state in Punjab region called Khalistan. That is land of Khalsa. To know more about Khalistan movement, I recommend you to watch our Hindu newspaper analysis video of 20th March 2023. So today we are not going to focus on that area. Instead, let us learn about what is separatism, factors contributing to separatism, and how these problems can be addressed. Okay? So what is separatism? As I already said, separatism is the idea or activities that advocates for separation of a group or a territorial unit from an existing country. For example, we can take the Khalistan separatist movement itself. Here the separatists are demanding to establish a separate state by carving out territories in India. This is a perfect example of separatism. So what are the factors that are contributing for separatism in India? See, the first and foremost factor is unbalanced development. If we can take development, the southern and western states in India are more developed when compared with northern and northeastern states. This unbalanced development is due to various factors like political, geographical and economic factors. This unbalanced development forces the people in an undeveloped state to raise the voice for separatism. Now the second reason is a religious factor. As we all know, India is a Hindu majority country and overall in India other religious or minority. This factor sometimes contribute to the insecure feeling among minority religious people in India. This forces them to propound separatism. Now thirdly, political factors. As we all know, India is a diverse country. Many national parties are not able to get a standhold in some states. So this led to the rise of regional parties. Some regional parties have their own unique identity and this is contrary to the national party's ideologies. This factor also contributes to separatism. And the final one is the linguistic factor. See, India is having diverse languages and diverse dialects. As we all know, the majority of people in northern India are speaking Hindi. But if we take southern states, the languages vary from state to state. So, if the government imposes one language countrywide, then it forces some people in particular state to demand for a separate country. So, linguistic factor also contribute to separatism. So, these are all some of the factors that contribute to separatism in India. Now, let us see some of the possible measures that can be taken to contain separatism. Firstly, the central government should divert its focus on underdeveloped states. The government has to bring in many developmental schemes in the least developed states for the betterment of people. This will reduce the separatist mindset of the underdeveloped and underprivileged people. Secondly, the government should take stringent steps against the religious discrimination faced by the minority people countrywide. And finally, the government can conduct national wide festivals and programs with the involvement of all the people from different religious and linguistic backgrounds. This will promote brotherhood among the Indian people thereby reducing separatist ideologies. Okay? Apart from this, development projects and policies should be inclusive and crafted according to the needs of the region. For example, schemes like Ek Bharat Shresha Bharat is the need of the heart which not only celebrate diversity in unity but strengthens the sentiments of the state and citizens. So these are all some of the important points that you have to note from this news article discussion. So with these learned points, let us move on to the next part of the news article discussion, which is the preliminary practice question discussion. Now look at this first question. Rapid financing instrument and rapid credit facility are related to the provisions of lending by which one of the following? Option A, Asian Development Bank. Option B, International Monetary Fund. Option C, United Nations Environment Program Finance Initiative. And Option D, World Bank. C, RFI is a lending facility of the International Monetary Fund. This provides rapid financial assistance. It is available to all member countries facing an urgent balance of payments need. Remember, it is a short-term credit mechanism. 
on the other hand imf's rapid credit facility provides rapid concessional financial assistance to low income countries facing an urgent balance of payments needed okay so the correct answer for the question is option b international monetary fund now moving on here pairs of reservoirs and states are given you have to find the incorrectly matched pairs first pair gataprabha telangana see gataprabha reservoir is located in the state of karnataka it is not in telangana so this pair is wrong the second pair gandhi sagar madhya pradesh see this pair is correctly matched it is located on the shipra river which is a tributary of chambal river okay now the third pair Indra Sagar Andhra Pradesh Indra Sagar is located in the state of Madhya Pradesh on Narmada river so this pair is wrong now the fourth pair Maithon Chhattisgarh Maithon reservoir is located in the state of Jharkhand not Chhattisgarh so this pair is also wrong so here the only correct pair matched is pair 2 so the number of incorrect matches are 3 right so the correct answer for the question is option C only 3 pairs now moving on it is a two statement question statement 1 additional grant is the amount granted in case the amount allotted by parliament is insufficient for a particular scheme in a particular financial year now the second statement says that supplementary grant is the amount granted for some new service which is not contemplated in the budget see here the terms are interchangeably used okay so both the statements are incorrect here the correct answer for the question is option d neither one nor two now the question displayed here is the prelims quiz question for you today just go through the question try to answer it in the comment section displayed here are the mains practice questions for you today just go through the question try to write an answer and post it in the comment section so with this we came to the end of the news article discussion if you like the video hit like do comment and don't forget to subscribe to shankar ais academy youtube channel now thank you for listening